I'm Peter Brown from Tiny and Sons Glass. Tiny and Sons Glass was established in 1978 when my father and brother and I were at 575 Washington Street in Pembroke. We're certified and qualified to do all your windshield replacement and repair. Tiny and Sons Glass is a community-based business. We have 12 mobile vans that come to you. If the weather's bad, you can come here to the shop. We have a nice waiting area, TV, Wi-Fi, kid-friendly, pet-friendly. We also can move about 15, 20 cars a day through the shop. Perfect for you when the weather's bad. So come on down to Tiny and Sons Glass if you need your windshield replaced or repaired. Tiny and Sons Glass, 1-888-64-TINYS. Just call. Thank you. Hello everyone, it's currently 7 p.m. So welcome to the Monday, April 23rd, 2019 meeting of the Board of Selectmen. Start out with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We wanted to start off tonight's meeting with a moment of silence for the passing of Brian Van Brighton. Some of us do. Uh, Brian Van Riper is a member of the planning board for many, many years. A uh, great asset to the town. Uh, the, uh, my condolences to, to Deb and his family. Um, and also, anyone that plays in the basketball court just outside of Town Hall, Brian was instrumental in uh, developing that project. Um, would be sorely missed. Well, yeah, Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to echo Jim's sentiments. I coached with Brian for several years. We had sons that were the same age that were on the same team and he was a, um, a very good uh, coach and a, a very patient guy because when you're dealing with 12 and 13 year olds you need to be patient and he was uh, a great high school athlete in his own right so he understood what it took to be uh, better than average and he was just a uh, terrific asset to the community as uh, Dan pointed out. Yeah Mr. Chairman if I could uh, just also add that uh, I came in contact with Brian many times in conjunction with the planning board and the town's zoning rules, bylaws, and he was a great asset to this town and he always put the town of Pembroke first. So he will be greatly missed. Very well. Uh, Order to the bank, you know me with Dolores Rezet, Rezet, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, from the Chamber of Commerce? Yeah. Please come up. Actually, right there. Thank you. I'm actually here. Second. <laughs> I'm actually here at the invitation of the Chamber of Commerce, but I'm representing New England Village, uh, which is a 501c3 charitable organization that's been a member of the Pembroke community for more than 15 years. And I wanted to just share with you very briefly a little bit about New England Village and who we are. I'm, I'm hopeful that most of you know who we are, but if you don't, we were founded in 1966 by a group of parents who were at a, a, special, a special needs camp with their children and looking at the dismal future their children had. It was either um, they were going to stay home or they were going to go into an institution. And these parents wanted more for their children and they came up with this enlightened model of living at the time it was quite revolutionary to form a community uh, where these adults could live and, and acquire skills and go out and be part of their community. So those families, one of those families summered in this area and they came across the old Sutton Estate on 27 and they purchased that in 1969, 80 acres, and in 1972 uh, the first 13 residents moved into New England Village. Uh, New England Village serves adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Disabilities like Down syndrome, autism, uh, we have some folks with cerebral palsy. Um, today, there are 80 people that live on our property. 
Uh, we consider ourselves a planned community. We have 17 group homes, uh, but we also have four locations. We have a location in Hanson, which does employment services and community-based state services. We have an organic farm in Clinton, which sells CSA shares and employs some of the people in our program. And then we have a brand new building that opened in Kingston in 2012, which is a day rehabilitation program. So we're serving 80 people residentially in Pembroke, and we're serving another 100 people from the community throughout our day programs. We also employ 250 employees in town. Uh, many of those people are from the town of Pembroke, and many of them serve on committees and, uh, and government, hold government roles here in the town. A couple of people that come to mind, Ginger Camo, who is the secretary of the Recreation Commission, uh, Kyle Harney, who invited me here tonight, he's the VP of uh, Pembroke Chamber of Commerce, and PJ Lowe, who's on the fund committee. So our employees live amongst you and uh, are working for the town of Pembroke. We as an organization also are, are actively involved with things that are going on here. Tomorrow we're hosting a lunch series with, series with the Pembroke Police. Uh, we're going to exchange ideas. On May 2nd, we're hosting the Pembroke Great Debate 2018 in our Shinegold Community Building. And on May 8th, we're doing the Clem Pembroke um, Chamber of Business After Hours. So we're very active in the community as well. Probably uh, the one thing that we hope you start learning about, or maybe you know about already, is our Solar Wellness Center. On our Pembroke property on, on School Street, we have a community health and wellness center where we offer all kinds of programming to everybody in the community. We have a therapeutic pool. Uh, we offer H2O joints in motion, water Zumba. We have yoga classes there. We have a fitness studio. We have an art room with a kiln. We do paint nights. All of this program is open to anybody in the community. We bring in specialists and instructors um, at a very reasonable cost. So we, you know, we ask you to check us out, and we welcome you uh, onto our property. Uh, in conclusion, I just want to say that when you think of nonprofits in Pembroke, I hope you think of us. Uh, we've been your neighbor for 50 years, as I said earlier. You're welcome to come tour our facility at any time. You know, check out our website, northernvillage.org. All our contact information is there. We're always looking for volunteers. We're always looking for employers. Um, people that we serve, the board members, and of course, the financial supporters. So I thank you for giving me a few minutes tonight just to make you aware of the organization, and I hope we can partner with many of you in the future. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Uh, it provides a what-if option, which 
monetary kind of way, it allows the policymakers to immediately see the effects uh, of a decision, policy decision, such as collecting market. So if you, uh, if this is constructed in a spreadsheet form and already provided with the town account. Uh, if, if the town wanted to see what the effects would be of an estimated collective bargaining of X, uh, you would go to a certain spot in the spreadsheet and put the percentage in, and it would literally ripple immediately throughout the forecast and make an adjustment to the gap. So it really gives you uh, a real-time opportunity to understand what, how the decisions that the policy makers are making, how that affects the and along with the forecast itself. Uh, by the way, I apologize for the part being so small. There are copies here if people are interested. The forecast is constructed in such a way that uh, individual tabs for revenue projections, expenditure projections, coal is debt, capital are all fed into the summary page. And most of the work in years to come, as you do a, each year you do a five-year representative forecast, you would make the adjustments to the those other tabs, and it would, again, it would feed the summary page. Now, the forecast for fiscal year 20 through fiscal year 2024 indicates uh, that getting in fiscal year 20, the town probably will experience a deficit of about $1.1 million. Most of this is driven by health benefits, uh, employee benefits. Uh, there is an additional best practices uh, changes that I put in here for free cash and capital use that slightly add to the deficit. But the primary uh, uh, area that impacts the deficit is employee benefits. Now, the uh, cumulative uh, deficit over the five year period is about five million dollars. However, since the requirement of state law that the budget is balanced on a yearly basis, the average uh, deficit per year is approximately one million dollars. And you see that at the bottom of your uh, of the first page, the summary page, you see a cumulative surplus as to the cumulative deficit running from one point one three million to four point nine million, but the second line the annual deficit is running from 1.3 to 1 million uh, Now, uh, that means that the over total revenue growth uh, for the community uh, is uh, approximately uh, 2 point, uh, on average, about 2.5%. The average cumulative uh, uh, expenditure growth is about 3.5%. Now, that's total revenue. I did a quick exercise before I came down here this evening, looking at only the recurring revenue. The recurring revenue would be property tax that they will receive. And the recurring expenditures, which is just departmental benefits, debt service, state uh, assessments, things of that nature. And that, uh, the gap between the revenue and expenditure for recurring revenue and expenditure is only about one half of one. Uh, so some of this deficit is accumulated in the areas of the uh, expenditure portion that are related to strategic concerns. Now why don't we go on to uh, the uh, revenue. Again, unfortunately the PowerPoint presents it in a smaller font, but on the package we managed to get a nice neat package here that uh, shows you completely all the revenue uh, that the uh, town is at. The, uh, we start with property tax. Property tax uh, is the easiest to project of all revenues. Uh, it's prior year tax of the current year taxes plus 2.5% plus new growth development plus any debt exclusion overrides minus any school building assistance. That's the formula you get. With some level of uh, accuracy, you can predict uh, far into the future what your property tax revenue will be. The average uh, new growth development over the last 10 years is about $360,000 a year. And so we plug that in uh, as a use of use as an average to get to this five-year projection. We also uh, included in all the existing excluded uh, uh, debt uh, that passed in the property tax. 
And so your total revenue for property taxes is about 61% of your total revenue. The next area is uh, state aid, and it's a small font, but you can see it under printed version. State aid uh, is, uh, well, we like to say that it's usually conservatively forecast. Uh, most communities don't really have a large increase in state aid unless there's really a, a surge in the enrollment growth in the school system. And I haven't heard, I understand that you're going from part time to full time kindergarten, uh, but that would be. Uh, and general assistance, we raised it by 1% uh, per year, and the remaining small uh, state aid categories, we, we just level funded. Again, your state aid represents about 22 and a quarter percent of your total revenue for your community. Now on to total uh, local receipts, and this is a little, little better. Uh, local receipts makes up about 6.7% of your total revenue. Two categories, excise tax and meals tax, we're projecting at a 2% increase, uh, and the remaining categories we're projecting at an annual growth of about 1%. I put the 1% in only because it's it's something we want to encourage cities and towns to do, to constantly go back and look at their, their current fees uh, to see if there is a growth uh, potential in the, any of these fees. So we put that in the 1%, but again, it's a very, very small amount of dollars in a 1% category. Uh, now the next category is other available funds. Other available funds make up only 2.67% of the total revenue. Now this is a category that has a lot of, many of, many of the items in this category are recurring, but uh, a great deal of them are uh, dedicated for a specific purpose. That's the best way to describe it. It's for uh, uh, septic betterments, cemetery funds, uh, revolving funds, uh, transportation, school athletic deals, things of that nature. There are some recurring revenue in this category, particularly your overhead charges for water, trash, and possibly ambulance that possibly could be increased. But that's something that the policymakers have to decide to do. I just, it isn't something that we can project that you will do. Uh, and uh, so this entire category is just essentially rubber funded. But again, it represents only a very small portion of the total revenue. And finally, uh, the last revenue category is that of free cash. Now, this is one of the areas I had mentioned in my earlier statement that the Collins Center had implemented or inserted into this forecast some best practices in the areas of free cash and capital. Um, the best practices uh, and uh, generally accepted accounting practices say that you should match recurring revenue against recurring expenses. So therefore, recurring ex re revenue is property tax, state aid, local seats. Expenses, recurring expenses are your departmental, your benefits, your debt service. Free cash is a non-recurring revenue. You might have free cash from year to year, but it goes up and goes down, it goes up and goes down. It's, it, it's impossible to forecast. Now the town of Pembroke is, has been using a great deal of their free cash for strategic reserves, and that is an appropriate use of free cash. That's an excellent thing to do. But the town is also using a piece of your free cash to uh, support the operating budget. Uh, in fiscal 19, I believe it's $500,000 plan uh, for that uh, free cash plan to support the operating budget. That is taking a non-recurring revenue and using it to support a recurring uh, expenditure. And that's not the best practice. And so for the purposes of this forecast and as for best practices, over a period of that five year period, we phased out the piece of free cash that was going to be used to support the operating budget from 500,000 in 19 and then 100,000 less each year. So that in fiscal year 2024, finally, you phased out free cash to support the operating budget altogether. And that's not saying you're not going to have free cash. You're going to have free cash, whatever it's going to be. But you can use it for things that you think are necessary. Your strategic reserves, your capital, your OPEDs, your separation pay, your ice and snow deficits. Those are the appropriate uses of free cash. 
uh, OPEB's attorney to mention that 111 X workers' compensation funds. All are appropriate. Um, so that's one of the things we did in here uh, as a, a college group, inserting a recommendation on, on um, best practices. Now, the cumulative effect, as I said, when you look at just recurring revenue, the recurring revenue is growing at about 2.45% a year. On, the, on that first spreadsheet, you saw that it says 2.88%, but that's all revenue. All revenue is growing by 2.88%, but recurring is growing by 2.45%. That's a slow growth. Uh, you're, you have a, a small footprint here, uh, but uh, usually with the property tax, 2.5% plus new growth, usually that gets you to about 3%. Right now, it's it's not getting you to 3%. So your new growth is, is lower than average in this community, but if, if there's more development that comes into the community, that could be plugged in uh, and uh, add to the base for, real, uh, for revenue. Now, uh, this is the average of the new growth. I just talked to you about it. Convenient for having it that way. So we take the total new growth. Uh, you have the residential, commercial, and industrial, and you see a five-year average, and you see a ten-year average. The five, the ten-year average is about three hundred and sixty thousand. The, the five-year average is three hundred and ninety-four. Uh, the reason I hesitated to use only the five-year average is you see in eighteen was a large bump. Uh, you had six hundred and seventy-six thousand dollars, which is really uh, outside the, uh, the curve of the, re the prior nine years. And so I thought it best to use a 10-year average to smooth that out. You don't want to have an overly optimistic estimate and then find yourself at the last, just before you balance the budget, you find yourself not having your growth because then you have to go back to the drawing board and rebalance your budget at the 12th hour and that's not a pleasant thing to do. So, on to expenditures. Now again, this is a, unfortunately a very small font, but in the presentation or the text that was submitted to you, or managed to get it on one sheet, and it's a little easy to read. Uh, we have, uh, in all of the departmental uh, budgets, we have two categories. We have wages, and we have non-personnel uh, non expenses. Uh, and so we use, uh, for wages, we're using a COLA of 2% plus steps of one half of 1%. So your revenue pr is projected to grow, to your cost for salaries is projected to grow by 2.5% a year. The non-personnel items in each department are projected to grow by 1% per year. Reasonable assumption. There are many times, I know, some communities that basically level fund all the non-personnel items, uh, except for the ones that are extraordinary that require the contractual uh, agreement to uh, increase most of the other things are level fund. But in this particular case, we want to put a bookmark in there, so we put it at 1%. Uh, we have the education department at 3%. Again, it's one number. We don't want to uh, 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 drive where the school department is making the decisions on collective bargaining. Experience tells me that the collective bargaining in the schools is a little different from the collective bargaining in the town. Uh, they, the schools also have other cost drivers, uh, such as special education, sometimes transportation, uh, that drive those budgets up. So typically, in our forecast, the Collins Center uses about a 3%, sometimes as much as a 3.5%, but in this case, a 3%. We also use uh, the existing debt, both uh, excluded debt and non-excluded debt is included in uh, the forecast as well. But in addition to that, you had a, some um, authorized but yet to be borrowed debt, a non-excluded debt. Uh, and we met with the finance uh, team and we get the best estimate from the team as to when that, those projects would be borrowed, what the term would be. And so we included uh, an estimate of the debt service for those yet to be borrowed projects in this forecast as well. Uh, now, on to uh, capital. Again, this is the second area that I mentioned that the Collins Group likes to uh, inject uh, some best practices. Uh, 
the average community is spending somewhere between three and a half and five percent per year per capita. Uh, and the town uh, uh, of Pembroke is spending for fiscal year 2008-19 uh, 1.7 percent, so it's low. And so we did a couple of things here. First of all, as the non-excluded debt is retired, in other words, the debt service is running down, we <coughs> took the savings from the retired debt and plugged it back into capital as a patient. In addition to that, uh, we uh, have some money going into in the general government recurring revenue into uh, capital. And we also have free cash going into capital. And so, from a, over a period of uh, actually six years, from fiscal 20 to fiscal year 25, we slowly raised the percentage of revenue committed to capital up to the level of about 3.5%. Uh, and that, that adds slightly to your deficit, but it is really is the best practices uh, out there. You should have uh, some ongoing commitment to, uh, to capital. Now, the biggest problem here in this expenditure side is health insurance benefits. So benefits, complete benefits. Health insurance benefits is the major driver, of course, it is in every community. Uh, uh, we are forecasting that your health insurance benefits will be increasing by 7.5% a year. And of course, when one piece of your budget is increasing by 7.5% and your overall revenue is increasing by 2.5%. That's where you start to see the gap. The gap is created primarily by health insurance. And it, it is the same for every city and town in the Commonwealth. This is not something that is special to, to Pembroke. Another thing that is a driver is uh, Medicare. Medicare, you know, it was implemented in 1986, 87, supposed to be 1.45% of the salaries. But of course, if we're projecting salaries to increase by 2.5%, we have to increase Medicare by 2.5%. So th that uh, expenditure line is also being increased by 2.5% uh, a year. And uh, so uh, the rest of the uh, in, uh, benefits, we just have a slight inflation factor of 1% in there, I believe. One of them is for uh, uh, workers' comp, and the other one's for deductibles and chumps for that, but we put those in at 1%. Now, overlay. Overlay, uh, we just took a quick analysis of what the overlay was to the levy. We find it, on average, to be about a little less than 1%, 0.88%. And so we used 0.88% of each years profit tax levy, and that represented uh, overlay. And so the remaining uh, uh, expenditure, and this is one more after, is uh, state assessments. Uh, we typically put state assessments as an increase of 2.5%. This is a very, very small revenue category, expenditures category, excuse me. Uh, it's a uh, grand total is $860,000, so it's a very small incremental increase. It's about $30,000, $35,000 a year uh, with this inflation of 2.5%. And finally, as I explained to you, free cash, we're, we're trying to grow the free cash. And there's a slide that I will show you later. But we're trying to grow the free cash, excuse me, we're trying to redirect the free cash to capital and strategic reserves. We're trying to redirect the free cash away from the general operating services. Um, and so there's a calculation in here. Uh, we, did a, we did a quick review of your free cash. And I'll, I'll, I'll say this, it's important to say this, nobody in their right mind would forecast or project what free cash is. Do not ever try to estimate what free cash is until it's certified. And then the state will tell you what you have. Uh, but for the purpose of having a, a bookmark in the forecast for uh, items, strategic reserves, which would be supported by free cash, uh, and after consulting with your finance team, uh, it, it became apparent that 
basically you have about 2% a year uh, of your operating budget that is uh, turns into free cash. 1% from underestimated revenues, 1% from turnbacks of expenditures. Now, um, so what we did is we, we took the annual, the net revenue uh, and uh, of, the, of the community, and we took 2% in year one, and then 1.9% in year two, and we just dropped it by 10 basis points a year, just to be a little conservative. Even though the revenue is growing from year to year, by 2.5%, uh, we, we, we we're slowly dropping down what our forecast for free cash was, but then taking that free cash and distributing it to the strategic reserves that you and your community have correctly uh, used free cash for. Again, it's uh, snow uh, deficits, 111 Fs, uh, workers' compensation, separation pay, OPEBs, uh, and yes, capital. And so we, we've done that as well. And so the total cumulative increase for uh, net expenditures, uh, excuse me, recurring expenditures, is 2.95%, as opposed to that first spreadsheet that said uh, about 3.5%. So you see the recurring revenue against the recurring expenditures we have recurring expenditures of 2.9%, 2.95%, recurring revenues of about 2.45%, or our real true gap of about half of a percent. Uh, the rest of it is basically free cash. Uh, now, I wanted to take you to this. This is the COLA analysis. And this, this one if, what if scenario, this one if, what if uh, tool that we had just discussed. Across the top, you see fiscal years, and you see co a Kohler estimate, and you see a step estimate, and then each of the general departmental categories, general government, public safety, whatever, those are the salaries. And so if you wanted to say, well, what happens if we wanted to give a 1% collective bargaining rather than a 2%? Or what if we wanted to give a 3% rather than a, a 2%? You just change the top row, and it ripples to the expenditure tab, and it ripples to the summary page. And in real time, you'll know what the impact would be if you wanted to change your collective bargaining. You could, uh, you, you have, you don't use this tab for it, but you could do similar things for some of the expenditures. Out to the far right, uh, I'm not sure it's picked up on this thing, so I'll show it out here. There's a column here that shows percentages, and if you wanted to just change the percentages of growth, inflation growth or either revenue or expenditure, you change that column out to the right on the revenue tab of the expenditure tab, and they would ripple off to the appropriate tabs into the summary page. And in real time, again, your, uh, your, uh, the effect of that policy change would be immediately uh, seen. So that's a really interesting tool for uh, policy makers. Finally, oh, we have two spreadsheets here on uh, capital investment, and this is the one where we're trying to show you, uh, we're trying to dedicate or increase your uh, amount of money committed to capital. You see at the top, you see the existing non-exempt debt service, and you see uh, funds coming from uh, authorized and yet to be issued that were plugged in there. Uh, so you, you have a total existing capital of about one point. 1.8% in 19, and it goes down to 0.8% in 24. The reason for that, of course, is that uh, your debt service is retiring. As your debt gets older, you're paying it off. It's like mortgage. Uh, and, but in the second section down below, you then see us imposing some best practices in which we take the debt service runoff, uh, and we add that back in. We take new operating recurring revenue, and we add that in and we take a bit of free cash and add that in. And so on the bottom line, you see a percentage down at the bottom, you see for 19, fiscal 19, 1.7%. And we're trying to slowly, by a quarter of 1%, raise your capital commitment over each year until you get to a target amount, which we think at this point in time for the community probably is about 3.5%. Uh, and you can see that on the next spreadsheet a little better. And again, on the pass up to the two you see that far column, you see the percentage rising from 1.7, and it goes up by a quarter percent each year until fiscal year 25, in which you hit your target of 3.5%. Now, if you wanted to change this, if you wanted to have less of a commitment, or if you wanted to have more of a commitment, 
you would go to the, basically it's the central column that says uh, GF appropriation, general fund appropriation, and in there, in each of those cells, there's a formula that tries to get it to the percentage up to the right. So you could just, if you, if you chose, if you thought that you, that wasn't the right percentage for you, you could change it right there. So, with that said, th that's the forecast. I believe that the uh, a gap of one half of one percent of recurring is is not insurmountable, but it's something that uh, you now know. You now know it in April. Uh, typically, this information would be provided to you in November of calendar uh, of eighteen, which would be the middle of. Fiscal year 19, working on fiscal year's 20 budget. So now you know what the gap, the gap between revenues and expenditures is for fiscal year 20, and how the policymakers of the community can have a discussion about what to do to resolve the budget issue. I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have. On. Thank you for that presentation. Very well informed, and I appreciate that. And just before we move on to the question section, I just wanted to make clear that. This meeting is being made available to the public to a live video and audio broadcast on Comcast Channel 15. And any comments made will be recorded for future days. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the research and the presentation. Uh, this is going to be a valuable tool uh, for the town. Uh, generally, uh, who in the town uh, uses this as the tool? Is it a town accountant, town administrator, town manager, or a combination? Well, well, first of all, I, I, I can say the word team because they do it together. The, the, the spreadsheet, the file, uh, would be uh, uh, residing with the accountant. All right, but I am sure the town administrator, the accountant, the treasurer will all be working together as they usually do in assembling a proposed budget for uh, the board of selectmen to review and the finance committee to review. Uh, they they put together the variables and come up with a proposal. The town administrator would propose to the selectmen and the finance to be a, a balanced budget. So it would, it would reside with the team. I think it would be on Michael's computer. Also, I should also say that in addition to the spreadsheet, there's a user guide. We put together a how to do this uh, manual, uh, which we've presented to the town. And again, it resides with the financial team. Okay. Um, first of all, excellent job. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I would like to point out on the uh, second page, well, you have free cash this year, 500000 That's so like escrow. You have 98000 and then you're, the balance of ninety four you use the next year and get rid of that. So you're, there's, there's two two elements to one-time money that combine through about 600000 <coughs> Yeah, on the ambulance fee? Uh, no, the Civil Lake escrow fund, which goes to zero after. All right. Uh, well, yeah. That's that's like a savings. That's something that's uh, the ninety-four thousand is the last of it. It's gone. Well, that's it has zero yeah, something. Yeah. Right. I'm just saying that the five hundred thousand really is six hundred thousand in one time money. Uh, but then, um, I, secondly, education. You have that uh, projected at increasing at three percent a year. Yeah. In the last 10 years, our student population has dropped by 17.6 percent, mm -hmm. and the K through six has dropped by 27 percent during that period. So, we really are looking at a fairly fast drop in enrollment. So, at some point, uh, the Chapter 70 money will reduce, but at some point, we would have to make adjustments elsewhere. That's yeah. Well, what would mm -hmm. typically happen is two variables in this forecast would then change. Of course, the state aid revenue, mm -hmm. Chapter 70 revenue, and the school expenditure line. Mm -hmm. Usually, there is a political tug of war at town meeting on school budgets. Mm -hmm. I, I could say that at, at one point in time, I, at age 19, I was elected to a school committee. Uh, and usually there is a fight over it, but if enrollment is dropping, uh, the, that might be one of the areas that the Finance Committee and the Selectmen and the School Committee use to balance the budgets in the future. It's just but it has to be offset by some losses in state aid. Uh, yes, so you would have a reduction in state aid to go with it because the, that's based on a straight count. 
Yes, mm -hmm. but you're getting a small portion of state chapter 70 mm -hmm. for the, the school budget, which is a large. Yes. Um, that's. Um, oh, one other thing is that in your projection of uh, free cash that you were using, say it's two percent. Um, as you say, it's, it's impossible to say what is going to happen with free cash. But um, in the budget that we're operating on now, we increased our uh, estimates for. Uh, a lot of the local receipts by about seven hundred eighty-five thousand dollars at that time. So that's obviously going to come out of future free cash. True, but the way we set it up, mm -hmm. as we phase free cash out from the operating budget, mm -hmm. uh, and it's basically dedicated to strategic reserves and capital. Mm -hmm. uh, if the free cash is there, we use it for strategic, strategic not, reserves and yeah. capital. So it isn't enough. But if it's used for the operating budget, that's the perfect reason not to use not it for the yeah. operating budget. Mm -hmm. All right, are there any other questions? Seeing that. Well, thank you very much. I, it really has been a pleasure. I really enjoyed working with Ed on this project. It's been great. I wish you all could be able to work with us. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would like to thank Stephen and, and uh, the staff you know, for uh, a job well done. And uh, we're hoping to build on this. This is a learning tool that Mike and I talked about today. And, uh, we're definitely going to use this to our advantage, and uh, we're hoping to, like I said, build upon this with uh, the capital improvements plan and we're hoping to get uh, funded as well. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. All right, we'll move on to the board action items. First, it would be the adoption of confirmation adoption on the website for official method of posting and meeting notices under the open meeting law. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we've gotten uh, information that's in front of you <coughs> from, um, from our attorneys concerning changes that uh, the Attorney General uh, has made in the open meeting law over a period of time. And since those changes have been implemented, uh, the Attorney General has received many requests seeking guidance from municipalities as to who has the authority to adopt alternative posting methods. And as you know, uh, this board a while back agreed that the posting of the minutes would be best served by having it on the website. And uh, that is what we've been doing. So our attorneys have recommended that we just take another vote to say that that is Pembroke's official method of posting. So if there were no questions, I would move to adopt the town's website as the official method of posting meeting notices. Second. Second. All right, the motion is second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? If we're done, I vote aye as well, so it passes again. So. Mr. Chairman, we did have a, um, an email today from a constituent uh, that had questioned how we were notifying and what the process is to notify the townspeople of an upcoming town meeting. And um, I think we need to look at it. You know, because it's the official way of making notification, but in a broader sense, to let more people know and to include more people in the uh, town meeting process would not be a bad idea. I think it's a good idea as well. I think we should look into that. Do you have any suggestions for it? Yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, the town clerk has got um, a um, Process that it goes about three weeks in advance of the uh, town meeting that there are um, notices posted on the uh, intersections of Route 1453 as an example, and I think we could make better use or um, some good use out of the flashing signs that we have, and um, you know, making notifications to um, you know our merchants 
that are in uh, areas that there's a lot of traffic, a lot of foot traffic. And that could include, you know, Franklin Center, and it could include the, uh, the town center, and, you know, make it uh, available in paper form, you know, a notification to say we're having, um, you know, our, uh, our town meeting on the 12th of, uh, or a town election is going to be on the 12th of uh, May. But it also might not hurt to set up a, um, a, a contact log with people's email because people get in touch with each other today by email as opposed to by um, phone or by paper or that kind of thing. So I think there's, there's a number of ways we can do it and um, all it takes is a little bit of um, you know, outside thinking and I think we're capable of that. Yeah, I think those are all good ideas. So I think those are things that should be. I have the idea myself. I think we should do a reverse line on one call so that everyone can have them. That's just another idea. I'll think yeah. about it. Is the, so right? so, the school's already sent out emails for all kind of community notices. So for all the parents that receive those emails, <coughs> so most of the uh, school children's parents have, are logged into a system where we get community notices and it includes anything from like, community events, benefits, races, activities, things like that, so that might be a consideration. That's an excellent idea. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if I just make a comment, uh, I saw the letter that Arthur uh, uh, was referring to and uh, we, we have talked about the low turnout and all the decisions that are made for all of the residents of Pembroke by a very small number of people. And we've even had to, over the years, uh, cut down on the uh, count that goes into being able to open a town meeting because we weren't getting the vote. So I think the suggestions are good, and uh, I would like to see uh, the board keep this on the agenda and uh, let's see if we can do more than we have been doing and when we get to maybe the town meeting in the fall uh, may not be too too late to try to get more people to the upcoming one in the day but uh, we should definitely jump on this and try to figure out a way to publicize it more. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll get a full house. Hopefully. It wouldn't hurt. Certainly not. Those are all the bad news. Okay, moving on to the next board action item, we'll be considering the appointment of a recreation commissioner, Rachel Quinlan of 78 Fairwood Drive. Are you Rachel? I am. Can I come on, yes. Rachel? Thank you. Good evening. I have um, two young children in second and third grade, and they're involved in many of the town activities for fields. So I'm sure just can have probably these all games, so it's not that this true fields.
five football, baseball, back football, lacrosse, basketball. So I think we pretty much have all of the fields and locations in town covered. So <laughs> hopefully I'll be able to give some input on what the uh, what each uh, field and the condition of everything is firsthand. <laughs> Thank you for contributing. If nobody has any more questions, I'll make them all good. Get something else. I'll move the um, appointment of Rachel Quinlan to the Recreation Commission. Second. All right. So you're right. Uh, motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We have none. I vote aye as well. So two minutes. Thank you. No, no, no. <laughs> All right, the next action item is the opening of the annual warrant for insertion of the CPC project recommendation J, which is the beach access mats, and the removal of article number 23 in the capital committee, and we'll close back up the annual warrant. I will be opening of the annual warrant. Second. There's a motion and a second to open the warrant. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. None. I vote as well, so we'll reopen the warrant. I would move the uh, insertion of CPC project recommendation J and the removal of Article 23 of the Capital Committee and then close the uh, annual warrant. Second. Uh, discussion? Uh, before we close the warrant, can we make recommendations on, on that CPC? Money? I have no objection. Uh, so on, on the motion, on the, on the two motions, if, if we could vote on those, yes, yes or no, and then have a discussion before we vote on the one. Sure. Okay. Um, can we just strike and close the mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll accept that as a compromise. So, uh, what is the recommendation? Uh, well, we have the motion, motion made and seconded, so uh, I, I think we we'll call for a vote. And then I just want to ask for a call for the selection recommendation on the article. All right, so the motion is second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Any opposed? Okay, none. The passing the uh, so. uh, On the CPC project, uh, I move favorable action. Second. All right, motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, I vote aye as well. So, also pass. In district clarification, recommendation J is to appropriate the sum of $7,710 in fiscal year 18 open space reserves, and that said funds be granted to the town of Pembroke under the direction of the town administrator for the purchase of handicapped mats for the beaches at town landing the middle sandy bottom pond, or take any other action related to their take. Right, that's uh, I've been working for probably about a year now. So, uh, with that online right of the uh, Commissioner of Disabilities to get this through, we finally found a product that will work uh, to enable handicapped beaches, uh, access to the beaches, uh, and it has worked with the CPC uh, committee to, to get it on the warrant. So, I'm glad that's moving forward and hopefully town meeting will approve as well. Uh, make a motion to close the one. Second. All right, motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? Hearing none. Vote aye as well. So the warrant is now closed. Next action item is to consider the recommendations on the annual warrant article number 21, which is town manager article. So, uh, just to clarify, uh, with Sabrina or through Sabrina, mm -hmm. uh, this article is already on the on the warrant. Uh, we just need to come to a conclusion on the revenue okay. language. Uh, that's how it was left with that's the town meeting today, correct? Yes. Yes. And now the town council changes have come through. The town government study committee's recommendation to bolster credentials 
uh, was incorporated and this final version looks very similar to the original article that was submitted but it's been refined and fine-tuned down to what's currently relevant. Right, and uh, so everyone knows, no matter how deep you read into this, there are no boards or commissions, elected boards or commissions that will be eliminated in the Town Manager Act. That was a very important point uh, that the Town Government Study Committee uh, wanted to make, uh, that it was never their intention. So if there was any uh, misinterpretation about uh, a previous language uh, that is not in this. Uh, it was never the intention of this town government study committee to have that in there. So I just want to make sure the public's clear on that. Uh, and we, we can talk further on it, but uh, what we have before us here is, uh, is the language to include into the town meeting warrant. And I'll make a motion to include the language uh, as written before us today uh, to be incorporated in Article 21. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I had a question I'd like to uh, ask. Um, under the uh, Section 3, Town Manager, number 2, Qualifications, uh, I thought that this was a, a, a broad statement here. There is, uh, there is no requirements that I find in this regarding education or prior experience for modern to apply for the job. Okay. Uh, I just want to make a uh, clarification. The packet that we have in front of us does not include the amendments from town council today. Uh, I'll pass this to you after, but do you mind if I read the qualifications that are sure. expanded? Yeah, and town council's recommendation. Uh, qualifications, as you mentioned, the town manager shall be a person of demonstrated ability of administrative experience in public management or business administration was qualified by reason of education and experience. Candidates shall be persons with executive and administrative qualifications and especially fitted by education, training, and experience to perform the duties of the office. The town may from time to time, by bylaw, establish such additional qualifications as may seem necessary and appropriate. Uh, that's directly from town council as to keep it broad, uh, but have some specific qualifications in there. Uh, one of the qualifications that the town council uh, uh, left off purposely was adding in an MBA, for instance. You want to have it. You want to have it. Uh, a person with qualifications, experience, and education. Uh, but to keep it specific, you pigeonhole the chances of getting someone who uh, may not have that specific qualification. That was the explanation that I got. I uh, raised the issue only because. I have seen uh, uh, ads from other towns who have been looking for a town manager. And in reading through their ad, uh, they not only identified uh, a specific degree, usually a master's degree, along with a minimum of five years of experience working in a town, a municipality. And, uh, that's why I bring this up. Uh, I don't know, comparing what you just read, approved by our legal department, versus what I've read from other towns, uh, I, I still think we should have a minimum. Uh, but what, what, what is the committee's on that. We just got the Town Council's uh, recommendation for language uh, this afternoon, so the committee has not met. Uh, I will ask, I, I suppose I'll reach out to Ed <coughs> if, or Sabrina, who, did anyone have a personal conversation with Joel or did you just answer an email? Oh, and I've been working with Tim Brennan, who was authorized by Town Government to refine that one piece. Right. And Tim Brennan's refinement included what you just read to Mr. Stone, as well as an additional piece right at the very beginning, which is one sentence. And it simply was intended, apparently, to broaden the, um, well, here, I'll just read it. Do you want to read it? No, no. Okay. There shall be established in the town of Pembroke the office of town manager. 
the town manager shall be appointed. I'm sorry, the last sentence. The committee, the board of selectmen shall create a search committee to assist in, assist in the selection of candidates for the position of town manager. The committee shall be composed of two selectmen, one advisory board member, and two at-large members from the general public. Candidates shall be persons with executive and administrative qualifications and especially fitted by education, training, and experience to perform the duties of the office. The town may, from time to time, by bylaw, establish such additional qualifications as seems necessary and appropriate. The town council had brought everything else in and then asked for town government studies for finding the qualifications, and that is how that came to death. So you're trying to stay away from the specifics of things like um, must have a master's degree in uh, public administration and that kind of thing. So they can not take some of the master's degree might be in uh, business or what have you. Um, and they're all in all a better candidate perhaps. That was the interpretation of the town council. Uh, it, it, it seems just. The uh, search committee, the search committee can have their own uh, qualifications in mind for who's, who fits the bill uh, when they sit down and interview uh, potential candidates. And also town meeting uh, is allowed to, to to refine this even further, uh, specifically in the language that gives you that ability. So if, uh, if, it, if it doesn't work, we, we have the ability to, um, to refine this. But I, I can see it working. Town Council has um, has put thought into it, and um, he considered it uh, through his office, through his experience, through his uh, his legal expertise, and uh, this is what he's offered us uh, for language. Okay. Uh, are we going to go through this? What's in front of us tonight? Because I have some other questions. Or how or how do you want to handle this? What's the timeline? You're talking specifically about the uh, town manager? Yeah. The, the duties and powers and how he fits in with the Board of Selectmen. And uh, whatever is in this document. You want to read it out? Um, so I don't think it's fair to go through every, if, if you have any specific questions, uh, maybe we should hold, hold this vote off until the government study committee comes in and uh, you can have a, a, a frank discussion with all of them. I'm not chairman of the committee, I am on the, I am on the committee, uh, but I don't, feel, uh, I don't feel it's appropriate for me to, to speak for the committee as a whole, uh, although I, I do know most if not all the answers. Uh, but if you, have, if you have questions that were put out on people's mind at town meeting floor, I want them to be answered before town meeting. Mm -hmm. If the selectman is pushing back on this, then we're in trouble. So I want to get it cleared up. With well, the yeah, my statement that said I have many questions about what's here in front of me, which concerns the authority and the powers granted to a manager. Uh, I in no way want to indicate that I'm opposed to this idea. I just have operational issues here. Right, and, and, and which is fine. We should clear it up with the, with the committee itself. Um, and that would be my suggestion. That way we can answer you clearly and fully. Um, and if, if you want to let us know any questions um, that you have, so we can make sure we have the answers for you ahead of time. Uh, because they may have already been thought about, Lou. And there's a reason they're not in there, or it may have been an oversight that you'll help us fix. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, just timing-wise, um, the committee will be in front of us next Monday night. With uh, uh, do we have a final document that they just haven't reviewed? Is that is that the situation? No, no they've reviewed it. Okay. The final document. Um, is the final document in front of you. All right. The board of selectmen is signing this line tonight. Okay. At which point it's locked. That doesn't mean changes can happen on time in the floor. So we, we don't have time to have the full committee here uh, to address the news concerns. Well, before town meeting, it's a very good idea. So everybody feels good at town meeting. But as far as the recommendation goes, 
and the changing of the language, the warrant goes to the judge tomorrow. It has to post. It has to post. So, so we are up against we are up against the, the timeline. Uh, but that doesn't stop us from from, from uh, if there are changes to be made from your concerns uh, to to amend it at town meeting floor, as we have, as almost every article always does. Uh, what's printed in the town warrant and then what's made as a motion uh, in the spirit of what's printed is changed uh, from a couple of page uh, quite often. Okay. Is there I certainly want to put up the town meeting floor and let the discussion take place over the next two weeks. We can, we can recommend it as favorable, favorable action uh, as that's the thought. With the language being discussed at the town meeting floor, I think it'd be important for the selectmen to uh, have a favorable action or unfavorable action. The town meeting floor is um, not taking the proper stand that, that we as policymakers should take. Uh, well, I just think to move to allow them to be comfortable. Well, I tell you what, I don't want to do. I don't want to get up to town meeting floor and challenge the article and start asking one question after another. I don't think that's proper, and I don't think it's something that we should be up against doing. So I would be willing to write out some questions that I have that I thought we could discuss. and. Uh, have them ready for next week or pass them on ahead of time, whatever. I don't want to have a big argument on town, town meeting floor on half a dozen things because that that's not going to do any good. That's, that's not going to help. Any doubt on any article, even a kernel of doubt, is bad for an article. I've, I've supported this form of government going back in time. So this isn't anything new to me. It's just the way some of these things are written. A lot of them concern the Board of Selectmen's um, role. Uh, and I, I just had some questions. Whatever way you want to do it, I'll do it. Well, since we're since it's going to the printer uh, before we can meet with the government council and study committee, if we can, as a board, place place it. It's already on the warrant. Place it on the warrant <coughs> with, with the language that that's been amended today from town council. Town government study committee, I'm, I'm certain, will be made available to this board next week to, to discuss any, any questions that you may have. And there will be, there are going to be a lot of questions on town meeting floor because it's an important article, it's important things for the town, so I'm sure people will have uh, questions even if they know this inside and out, they'll have questions on town meeting floor. Uh, and that's right because it's, uh, it's an important decision for the, for the whole town, so we want to make sure we get it right. Now, the piece on the Board of Selectmen is only one page long. Do you want to just insert that piece out and talk about it? Well, what do you have? I, do you Section want to talk about it tonight? If, because I just don't want to put put the, the full committee on there, but there's something that I I might be able to answer right now. What are your questions? You have a, uh, uh, what's called a draft town manager article summary, which, uh, shows, uh, which shows the current uh, setup for the town administrator and uh, what falls under the town administrator. And then you have another call on uh, what is being proposed. And there's, uh, this is just an explanation. Uh, I don't know 
if we're going to be discussing this. Uh, I'm not opposed to it because I know what the town meeting does. Right, that's not actually in the warrant. That's a high level overview. Yeah. Just for you to quickly grab the sections yeah. that are kind of just here. But this is something that's going to cause some discussion. The changes? All right, so we talked about the qualification question. Yeah. Uh, it also says in here the board of selectmen from, uh, may from time to time establish additional qualifications for the office of the town manager. I don't have a problem with that. I just wanted to point out that that's in here. Um, one of the questions I had was on the powers of appointment as provided for in this act, appoint and remove all non-elected department heads and approve the appointment and removal of all other employees except employees of the school department and the fire department. Now, my question is, are the selectmen going to be involved in that? Apparently not. Now, that's one of his powers. That's a, town, a good town manager by law that attracts the best town managers to your town, uh, whether it's the bylaw that's proposed before us or towns where it works and works well, the town manager has appointing, appointing capabilities. A strong town manager attracts strong candidates. If you give a town manager a wishy-washy um, set of duties, you're going to get a wishy-washy candidate. Okay. Oh, I, I certainly agree that this position requires a very strong candidate, very experienced person. Another question I had here is it says the town manager can transfer all or part of any unextended appropriation of a reorganized or consolidated department, board, or office to any other town department, board, or office. And my question is, is, is that something that maybe the town accountant would like? Does he agree with that? Put you on the spot, Mike. Why should the Board of Selectmen approve that? The transfer of funds with, with, with no input from anybody? I would just as soon stay out of this one. Okay. I, mean, I would just as soon stay out of this one if it's okay with the Board. Okay. Well, sure. where it concerns funds, sure. you know, yeah. that's why I'm asking. Well, uh, so. You have to understand where that comes from, where that language comes from. If there's consolidation between departments, if, mm -hmm. if the department becomes defunct, or, or the worker there becomes defunct, or, or moves over to another department, well, now you have you have a, a, a fund for a department that no longer exists. So it makes sense to take that and transfer it over to to the thriving department. That's this is not to take. It's not a show game to take money, money from one department to another. This is if if the, the manager uh, consolidates departments personnel, and there's there's a a bank account that goes with that. He can take that bank account that from an out defunct or consolidated department and bring it into the consolidated department. It gives him the authority to do that. That's where that comes from. Does that make sense? Yeah. Another question I had that just made me think of another uh, position the town needs that doesn't have, that the town manager is responsible to manage and be responsible for all town buildings, properties, and facilities, except those under the control of the school committee and the conservation commission. Um, 
And what I'm getting at is that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. I just wish we had a facility manager to help in that regard, which is another subject. Um, Under collective bargaining, uh, because I've been involved with that, this uh, made me look at this, and I guess I have an opinion on this. Uh, negotiate collective bargaining contracts on behalf of the Board of Selectmen. Which contract shall be subject to approval, ratification, and execution by the Board? The Board of Selectmen may authorize use of additional counsel as requested by the town manager to assist the town manager in the negotiations at its discretion. I bring that up because we have, uh, this board has found that it has been advantageous for the town to have the board of selectmen on the negotiating team along with an attorney and the town administrator. Um, I think that's worked out very well and I've been involved with many issues where we really had to depend on the uh, attorneys to help us understand issues. And I guess my only, my only issue is the town manager has to request that. So what you're saying is the town manager is going to do all the negotiations and um, he may or may not, she may or may not uh, ask for counsel. That was your question? Hmm? That was your question? Yeah. Did you want to bring up? I, I don't like the discretion part of it because I see how it's worked when we had an attorney all the time. This doesn't say there won't be one, but it says it's up to the town manager. It has to be a full one to bring counsel into a, a meeting. Well, then I don't know why we have that language in there then. We don't have language telling us to use town council either, but we do, because it's the right thing to decide to negotiate. Uh -huh. See, the problem with what we're doing here right now is that we should have done this before with the committee and the selectmen, and we should have gone through this stuff as it came up over a period of time. Now we're down to the gun, and uh, I don't know whether we're going to have that. So um, uh, I guess we just have to go with it because a big effort has gone into this by the committee that should be said because I'm not suggesting otherwise and we've had town council's approval of the language so maybe this isn't going to improve anything and if it's not going to improve it then there's no sense in spending time on it Oh, I have uh, one other quick question. Um, the Board of Selectmen may terminate and remove or suspend the town manager with a minimum of four affirmative votes to remove. Uh, now, usually we have votes of three. The supermajority. A special reason for that? The supermajority. Because I know it's a supermajority and there's a reason for the supermajority so that it takes the will, it truly will take the will of the board and not a couple of political um, uh, issues. If three selectmen have, have, have an issue with, with the town manager 
and they joined together to to oust him for uh, nothing more than political reason. Mm -hmm. That's what that's avoiding. It's okay. four fifths is a is a true super majority of the board, and therefore that'll be the true will of the board to get rid of the town manager uh, because. That's, that's the reason for that. You know, this is, you, you must be very familiar with, with this because this is really the same same article that um, the committee that you were on brought forth with just some, some adjustments and some, some tweaks. So these are, this, this, that was the basis of this entire article. Many years ago, yeah. a lot of change has happened. Um, I, th I think I brought that up about the four to one. I accept your answer. I, I think that's a good one. Because that is a very serious issue for the town to have to face to want to fire a guy that's running the town. Uh, I, I think I've read a couple of articles where other towns have ousted the manager for various reasons with a three to two vote. That's why I just. Well, yeah, and it can be, can be politically. We've seen in other towns, Lou. Uh, so we want board selectmen certainly to have the, the option uh, to do that for cause, but we also want to make sure that it's for cause and not for uh, some political reason. Yeah, I again, I don't think any issues that I have brought up, or there may be a, a few, I think there's a few more, but I don't want to go into it because none of the issues or questions that I have are where I'm going to suggest that we don't go forward with this. They're, they're clarification issues. Why have you said this? Such as the four to one vote. That was an excellent answer. It explained the whole thing. I accept that completely. So I think I'm willing to uh, yield the floor on this issue. Yeah, and, and Lou, I, please don't feel like you need to be cut short. I, I, I need you, I need this board of all people to know and understand this this article, and hopefully uh, we can express it to the town meeting. I'm in favor for it uh, for, for many reasons, so I want town meeting to be in favor of it as well, but I certainly want the need of the board of selectmen to be in favor of it. So hope, hopefully they are. Yeah, and I, I think there's a couple of other documents. I referenced one earlier. There's a, uh, an article summary in this, which, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, shows the structure of government under a town administrator and the changes that will take place if this article passes. And I think that's a, uh, another good piece of information for people who don't really understand how all this is going to work, uh, will show four or five changes that we've been used to prior, and if we go to a manager, it's all going to change. Sure, and, and the town government study committee uh, has been going around as they and will continue to uh, when they have time slots to get on uh, people's warrants. We're going to all the boards and committees in town to make the same presentation that they made to us uh, to get the word out to describe what's being asked here and when folks have questions uh, they can be answered and as they say if there's something in here that someone has a question on that we can answer to their satisfaction that's wonderful but if there's something that was an oversight or a better way to do it that we could insert uh, as an amendment on town meeting floor uh, we'd be amenable to that of course Good. You're not going to get 100% of the selectmen to agree 100% of the time any more than you're going to get 100% of the people at town meeting to agree. You're just going to make the best presentation you can make based on the solid research that you've done and the, um, you know, the, the answer to questions, the difficult questions. You know, I, I understand the super majority and I have to agree with this, but um, I think you, you need to... Um, put your best foot forward and you know the voters are smarter than people give them credit for. Uh, they generally make the right decision. I'm done. Thank you.
we have an argument on this? The motion was, was the motion maybe seconded already? I don't think there was a second on it. I think um, um, we went into um, his presentation. Make a motion to in include the language before us as amended by town council today. Uh, the language for Article 21. I'll second it. All right, so you have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <coughs> Any opposed? Hearing none, I vote aye as well. So it passes unanimously. The next action item is to consider the recommendation of the special the annual, annual warrant articles one and three. So Article one is to see if the town will vote to authorize the below listed supplement fiscal year 2018 appropriations and to authorize the below listed reductions in fiscal year 2018 appropriations or take any other action relative to the bill. I move the uh, board selection uh, support the article. Second. All right, so a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any none? And I vote as well, so I pass it again. Let's see. Sabrina, does that vote cover both these articles, or do we need two votes? We need two. Two separate articles. Article 3 is the, uh, the other article on the point. All right. So Article 3 is to see if the town will vote to raise an appropriate transfer from available funds and or borrow a sum of money to repair town and school buildings in accordance with National Laws Chapter 44, Section 7, Paragraph 3, or take any other action relative thereto. I had a question on this, Mr. Chairman. Sure. For the town administrator. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that we have no insurance coverage on these items. <coughs> well, actually, we did file an insurance claim. Uh, we're asking to borrow $180,000. Correct. Mr. Thank you. Um, most of this damage or most of the work that we're requesting to be done uh, is at Town Hall. There was some minor issues with the Community Center, minor issues with the library and police station. But the big three um, issues that we have in front of us are um, the Town Hall roof and cooking. They, um, once that storm, those three state storms came through, it was pretty evident that the roof is 40 years old. It's well past its useful life, and it's always better to replace a roof uh, a year earlier than it is a year later. $62,000 of this request is to put a generator over in this building, a gas fire generator. The police station, town hall, um, the data processing, the communication, um, Equipment is all integrated now, so if power goes out of town hall, it's a problem for the police station. And um, we also could, uh, I think the town would be well served by having um, standby power in this building too. And we also have, like, we have a four year old roof, we have a four year old elevator um, that also needs some um, certification. I think we this up today. The part we need, one of the parts we need to replace was made in 1962. It survived the fire of 78. <laughs> wow. So that's, that's the thinking behind this request. I would move favorable action on behalf of the West Second. All right. There's a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any not, I vote as well. So that passes unanimously. The next action item is to sign the annual town meeting warrants.
the motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, that would I as well. So passes unanimously. So now we can sign the annual. You can do that yep. while you're still conducting business. All right. So move on to the review the draft of the selectmen report for town meeting regarding the pension budget. Mike, you want to explain to the board what what we're going to do? Under Article 3, um, in the warrants, I think it's the copy that you have, uh, there is an additional column this year. Ordinarily, we have the recommendation of the town administrator in the far right hand column. This year, we have another column called 2019 Contingent. And there are four different, three different budgets, four different line items that. Are different between contingent and town administrator. Uh, the police department and fire department in total um, both have a two hundred four thousand dollar contingent increase, and DPW has a three hundred thousand dollar contingent increase. And what this means is we'll vote the budget um, in two weeks, and. The $708,000 question will be put in front of the voters. And if that question passes, the far right column becomes effective. If it does not, the town administrator column becomes effective. Question? Uh, when, when this article comes up, you have two different choices. Uh, is the moderator going to run through? Um, the town administrator's budget, which is the balanced budget, total, and then ask for a vote on that, and then go to the contingent, or how are we going to do that? If, if I were the moderator, which of course I'm not, I would read the town administrator's, um, this is how the motion's going to be worded too, that Sabrina and I will put together for advising. Um, I would read the town administrator's budget and if there on those four items where there are changes or the five items where there are changes, I would say police department, for instance, three million four hundred and seven thousand dollars and in addition three three million five hundred and sixty two thousand contingent upon. So only of those four items where there's a difference would I read off the property Yeah, I asked the question because I, I just thinking ahead of your explanation, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, if if the moderator read the town administrator's balance budget line by line item and asked the question like he usually does, and then asked for a vote on that, if, if that's a balanced budget, that budget could be voted on and passed, wouldn't it? And then what happens to the to the contingent? Budget. Well, that's why when he reads those items, it would have to be on the yeah. end of the additional convention on the yeah. Sabrina and I will work that out. Now, when we have the meeting and <coughs> advisory and the moderator, right. this, this will all come up. Okay, fine. Thank you. Any questions? So, do we need a vote for any kind of this? Well, the thought is, do you want to present the report? Do you want to do, you know, review it for a week and talk about it next week? Maybe. But it's a, not a bad procedural guide for voters coming to town meeting. Assuming the selectmen would like to do something like that. But if you wanted to take it under advisement, you can review it next week in front of yeah, Any time you have a change like this, which we, we haven't done it this week before, it's good to get the work and put something else. If the average person is coming, may I have not have come or will not have seen this before? Can talk about it next week? Sure. Okay, about me. The chairman? Sure, we can talk about it next week. I need a motion to table this for next week.
Move to the table for one week. Second. All right, the motion on the table for one week and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none. Aye as well. So we'll talk about this again next week. Moving on to old business, we have a record of approved bills and payrolls from 418-2018 before us. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, Governor Baker signed an act to modernize municipal finance and government, and under that new uh, act, the Board of Selectmen may designate one of its members for the purpose of approving bills or payrolls under this section. Provided, however, that the members shall make available to the board at its next meeting a record of such actions. And I uh, would like to uh, state for the record that uh, on April 18th, I am pleased to report that I reviewed, personally reviewed, three accounts, uh, three accounts payable warrants totaling $313,102.91 and two payroll warrants totaling one million two hundred thirty-eight thousand seven hundred ninety-five dollars and thirty cents prepared by the town accountant and authorized the itemized expenditures for payment. Signed Lewis W. Stone for the selectman's deputy. We need to move to accept that report. Yeah. So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? If none, I vote aye as well. So we accept it. Next act, next order of business, town administrative report. Mr. Chairman in chronological order the following. Uh, Saturday is has has this material day at the recycling center. The hours will be from nine to one. And the items that are accepted and not be accepted on the town's website and the information is also available in the Select and Town Administrator's Office. Um, while we're talking about the Recycling Center, uh, the Landfill Manager slash Recycling Center Coordinator and I are going to recommend to the board that we open on Sundays for the Spring Cleanup Program in the month of May and that would be Sundays on May 6th, 20th and 27th and uh, will not be open on Mother's Day, which is May the 13th. So if it's that agreeable with the board, we'll uh, post the openings for those three days. Okay. Please do. Okay. And then thirdly, um, you have a draft of the strategic planning survey that was done by Suffolk University. I would suggest to you folks that you read it. And, uh, and then if you have any questions regarding that, uh, get back to me and then we can make it official and have it distributed to the department heads and to uh, boards and commissions. Very interesting reading. So I think uh, we had a 25% response rate, I believe, and uh, we had over 400 people respond to it. And uh, you'll, you'll see all the demographics and the response uh, ratios and everything in the in the survey itself. So uh, anyway, so that's my report, Mr. Chairman. Question, if I may. Was that survey mailed to people? Yes. To what? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we're moving on to ask the selectmen. Uh, I know we have one inquiry we had earlier tonight. Does anybody have anything else to ask the selectmen? Yeah. On the new business. I've got a couple of things on the new business this year. Sure. Um, one is that uh, baseball kicked off this weekend, and the um, color guard from the police department was there, and it was very impressive. Um, the uh, chief's intention of um, reaching out to the public has um, certainly worked because it was a dozen kids, probably four or five year olds gathered around the police as they arrived with the flags and so forth and was, uh, was well presented chief. And um, we have some other news. Um, I was informed by Mr. Thorne that it's a great pleasure to inform you that you've been selected to the Mass Commission of Status of Women as the Commonwealth's unsung, one of the Commonwealth's unsung heroines of 2018. 
that's being presented to Marianne Smith, our retiring uh, town clerk. And there are details with how you can uh, attend and so forth. But it's uh, quite an honor for uh, Marianne.